Pollination is an important part of the commercial production of many crops. Even before Varroa killed most of the feral colonies in other countries, Australia still had one of the highest concentrations of feral colonies in the world. But if Varroa Destructor becomes established in Australia, based on overseas experience, we can expect to lose both unmanaged and managed colonies. With the majority of feral bees gone, and no longer providing a free crop pollination service, growers are likely to make more use of commercial pollination services. When Varroa arrived in New Zealand, there were relatively few feral colonies, and managed colonies were commonly used to pollinate crops. There were, however, some stone fruit crops that had been relying on a free pollination service from feral colonies. It wasn't until these crops suffered production losses that growers introduced managed beehives to their orchards. The need to control Varroa also required a shift in thinking and a change in beekeeping practices. Checking hives for the number and presence of Varroa and applying treatments to control the pest became common. Beekeeping costs increased with more frequent visits to hives and the added cost of treatments. Even if growers are getting good crop yields from feral bees and native pollinators, adding managed hives can often improve pollination rates further and therefore crop yield. Wherever we look we find there are wild pollinators in the system. There's native bees, there's about 3,000 species of native bees in Australia, and then there's other insects, flies and, and beetles, that can visit flowers and play a role in pollination. And it tends to be that when we look, we see that those insects are playing a bigger role than we probably appreciated, and they're doing it for free. So the best pollination outcomes happen when we get the free pollination happening from the sort of background of the system, and then we can add on top of that managed pollination in the form of, uh, of commercially provided honeybees. Depending on the crop, it can also produce a larger, better quality fruit. And because pollination is more synchronised, it can result in a more defined harvest period. When introducing hives for crop pollination, the number of boxes, the amount of brood and the number and health of the bees all add to the pollination rate. A single large colony of 40,000 bees may collect 100 times more pollen and nectar than a small colony with only 1,000 bees. Growers can ask to have a look in the hives when they are delivered to the site to make sure they meet a certain standard. As a general rule, the more evenly the hives are placed in a crop, the better the distribution of foraging bees. In our research in almond orchards, we found that there had been a tendency to place hives too far apart from one another, hundreds and hundreds of metres apart. And as a result, we found that the pollination outcome on trees that were relatively far from hive placements really wasn't as good as it could be. So what we're recommending is that if you're trying to manage for a good pollination outcome, think about bringing the hives uh, closer to the trees and what that really means is smaller distances between your hive placements, bring the bees to the trees. When a hive is moved to a new location, the bees start foraging on the first flowers they find attractive. This is why hives are not usually introduced until about 10 to 15% of the crop's flowers have opened. The number of frames of bees and brood needs to be designed with both the crop pollination needs and beekeeping practices in mind. For example, in New Zealand, where 80,000 colonies are used for kiwi fruit pollination, the standard is to have 12 frames of bees, 4 full frames of brood, 25% unsealed brood, brood in the bottom super, 2 frames of empty comb, 3 frames of honey and a young queen. Pollen or nectar foragers can be better for particular crops and colonies can be prepared to provide more of one or the other. Feeding colony sugar syrup inside the hives can double the amount of pollen they collect. Chemical use is, uh, is an important part of the production process for growers, of course. They need to protect their crops against insect damage. So most crops, most orchards have to be using pesticides at some times of year. And at the same time, we know that pesticides don't just kill pest insects, but they kill beneficial insects like pollinators. And honeybees are particularly vulnerable to pesticide effects. So there's a real balancing act there where a grower who really wants to protect the crop from pests but also get a pollination outcome has to make sure they're applying their chemicals uh, thoughtfully, applying them as little as possible, uh, only when necessary. And then of course communicating with the commercial beekeeper so there's no, no bee kills. And of course pesticides uh, impact wild pollinators too. So, and the wild pollinators can't be 
moved away to avoid pesticides. So they're a bit more vulnerable and we need to think about that when we're uh, applying pesticides in the orchard. There are so many aspects to providing pollination services that a contract between a grower and a beekeeper can be very useful to make sure both parties agree on what is expected. A standard contract might state the number and standard of hives, when and where they will be placed in the crop, notifying each other about what's going on, fees, payments and pesticide use. Australia has a healthy bee population and we want to keep it that way. If you see anything unusual on your bees, call the Exotic Plant Pest Hotline on 1800 084 881. For more information about pollination, go to the Be Aware website at beaware.org.au.